roses. We'll lift your spirits up in the garden with climbing roses. We'll share the grandeur of these tall beauties. Demonstrate how to train a climber to fill an empty wall with roses. And learn a 19th century English training technique that can add fullness to a leggy rose bush. It's all about climbing roses, next on DIY's Growing Roses. Welcome to our series on growing roses, the workshop designed to erase the myth that the world's favorite flower is a finicky one in your garden. I'm Maureen Gilmer. On this show, we'll focus on climbing roses. Now, technically, climbers are not a category of rose per se. They're actually a mix of roses spun off from many different classes. What this group does have in common, however, is that most climbing roses can produce canes six feet or even longer. Claire Martin is the rosarian at the renowned Huntington Botanical Gardens in San Marino, California. So let's join him and he'll give us a little background on climbing roses. Well, climbing roses are somewhat modern. This one is a climbing tea rose that's from about 1917. But the, the thing about climbing roses are they really require some sort of structure to attach themselves to because they really won't attach to anything. And you need to tie them onto a structure, uh, either a pillar or a ladder like we use here at the Huntington. They're just great shrubs. They bloom a lot and uh, quite often have great fragrances. This one is called Lady Hillingdon, which smells to me like it has a bit of um, apricots or fruit in it and a little bit of tobacco as well. Altissimo, the brilliant red one on the tea room, is an excellent rose. It's a lovely climber that blooms all through the season. But for the most part, the great expansion, the great explosion of, of climbing roses happened in the 19th and the early 20th century when hybrid teas began to be bred. When I'd be picking um, climbing roses for any particular area, one of the first considerations would be hardiness. Otherwise, I would go by color and just look around the neighborhood, see what other people use in your area for climbing roses. The worst thing you can do is pick a rose out of a catalog just because it's a beautiful picture. It may turn out to be a good rose, but in many cases, it may not be the best selection for your local area. In Europe, a lot of people love to train roses up, especially in England, up into trees. They use like an old uh, peach or an apple tree that's not producing very much anymore. And so in many ways, it's, it's a nice kind of way of using an older tree that's not going to be around too much longer. Most rose gardens tend to be at eye level or a little bit below. But the case with climbing roses, they make you look up at the sky and see the blue sky and see the roses against the sky. So Claire, what's the best way to fertilize climbing roses? Well, Maureen, I think just like you would any other bush, we use a timed release fertilizer here at the Huntington. We use some a product that lasts between three and four months. And generally, we just take a good handful and throw it around the plant, scratch it in lightly, cover that with compost or mulch, and water it in. You never want to feed a rose that's in need of irrigation. So if the plants are dry or the ground is dry, you want to water it the day before and then feed it the next day. Thanks, Claire. You know, that doesn't sound very hard at all. Now, don't go away. We have a great project coming up that you'll want to do in your own garden. We'll train a climbing rose to beautify a whole bare exterior wall. Growing roses. Now we're here in our demo area and it's kind of like a lab garden where we're going to show you a lot of different things. But today's how-to demonstration is a really exciting one because we're going to learn how to train climbing roses just like the ones you saw at the Huntington. Now, it may look and sound difficult, but with the right tools and instruction, you'll be able to do it yourself really soon. So let's get started. Now, we're beginning with this fabulous 15-gallon climbing rose, so we don't have to wait forever to get a big plant. And we want to espalier it onto this wall here. So we're going to show you how to create a real simple trellis that sort of dies back into the wall. It's, it's not so prevalent that you can see it from a distance. So we're going to run a wire straight across at this level, and then we'll run a second one straight across at this level. And ultimately, our goal is to help this rose grow up and onto the overhead arbor beams. So I've already measured and marked the positions of where I want to drill. Now we have a nice clean hole. And I'm going to take my little blue sleeve. 
slide it right in there. I want it to be nice and flush with the surface of the masonry. So we take our little eye screw and it screws in pretty easily. And I'm going to set it so that the eye is standing this way because our wire is going to pull this way and we won't have any problem with it pulling in the wrong direction. This is baling wire, but it's stainless steel. And that's really important because if you just use any old sort of wire, it will start rusting and it will stain the wall. So be sure you use stainless steel. And it doesn't have to be really heavy because you'll be doing a lot of the twisting with your hands. So we're gonna tighten this real tight on this end first. And this one's pretty stable. It's the other end that's real critical. And then as I pull it, I like to straighten the wire out the trick to this is to pull it as tight as you can through this hole. Remember, this is why we put the eyes in the way we did. And just bend it around like that. What it does is it holds the tension on this wire while you finish off the end. Once we've attached both wires to the wall and dug our hole, it's time to plant our rose bush. Now, if you notice that this rose isn't exactly centered on the root ball. In fact, it wants to grow on this side more. So let's turn it around so that the part with the greatest amount of growth is facing the wall. So you don't want to fight the natural growth habit of the rose. You want to take advantage of it and make it work for you in the way that you train it. Perfect. I think that's just right. OK, let's. Uh, backfill it so it gets nice and sturdy before we start working with it. Thanks, you guys. Now, when you untangle this, your goal is to get as much light and air to all parts of the rose as possible, because that reduces disease and it allows it to grow with much greater vigor. And the trick is to really try to work with that pre-existing natural habit and shape of the plant. Don't try to force it too much. And we'll prune off some of the material like this one, which doesn't really go in the direction we want. Remember that we're trying to make this rose grow up and out, and having development down here doesn't help it at all. Now, how you tie is really kind of important to how successful the plant will be. I like to tie it on very tightly onto the support structure, whether it's a wood arbor, a metal one, or wires like this. Now, when I bring this rose up here and attach it, I don't tie it nearly as tight. I leave some play. A good rule of thumb is to be able to stick your finger in the hole between the tie and your rose piece. And then you know it has plenty of room to give. Because what happens is if this gets really heavy or if it gets really windy, if there's no give in it, it'll break right off. Now here's another kind of tie material. Some people like it, some people don't. But the philosophy of tying is still the same. Now, the benefit to this stuff is it stretches as the rose grows in diameter, whereas that jute twine will never stretch at all. You don't have to give quite as much play with the stretchy plastic tie because it'll stretch out, and eventually it'll give itself enough room. And then we'll just continue tying all of these onto our wire. Now, as you can see, we've done some more clipping to make this work. But what we've done is fanned out this rose bush so that each one of its canes has its own little place in the sun. And that's how you train a rose climber to a bare wall. Now, up next, we'll visit a rose garden with some fabulous climbers that are trained back right onto themselves. It's called pegging. 
and the homeowner has a leggy climber that will rework into a beautiful form. Stay tuned. Maureen McMorrow has a great rose garden in South Pasadena, California that's just filled with beautiful climbing roses. Wow, this is such a beautiful little garden. Oh, now, what is your exposure here? This is just facing south, but it gets full sun all day long. So that's why there are more on this side than the other side exactly, of the garden. Exactly, exactly. I really like what you did with that central climber there. Well, you know, I put him on some bamboo stakes, just your basic... Like a teepee. Just made it into a teepee, tied it with some rope at the top, and then just started at the bottom and wrapped it around. God, how simple. And, and it takes, like, no space. No space, no effort, and you get the roses coming all the way up instead of just at the very top. I couldn't help noticing this rose. Right. It's very unique the way you've trained it. Tell me what you did. Well, this is called Queen of the Violets, or Ren de Violette. Um, and it's a very old bourbon rose that would like to grow very tall with one bloom at the very end of a long, whippy stick, which... Does not look good and doesn't fit. Does not fit in this little garden. So what I've done is this very old technique called pegging or self-pegging, where you take that long, whippy stick at pruning time and you bring it over in an arch and either tie it to itself or tie it to a stake. And once you do that, then the rose starts to grow these laterals that will come and produce each of these individual blooms off the middle. And you can see these, how they've come right off the top of the arch and they grow straight up. And you can see right here how the lateral growth now, instead of growing the way the whip would have done, it thinks it's terminal. And so it is growing up and it's responding to gravity. The plants know what's up, <laughs> they no matter what's how up. you twist them like this. Exactly. Now I saw another one over there that I think we could try this on. Let's go take a look. Okay. This is the problem rose in the corner of Maureen's garden is as you can see, it's just overgrown and it's not tidy like the rest of your roses. Right. So let's take this cane here. Yeah, we put the stake in here. This is what our anchor is going to be. Right. Because there's going to be a lot of pull pressure on this once you get it in position. Exactly, exactly. So we're going to just take, a, find, find a cane that's supple and take it down carefully. Slowly. And slowly and bring it back in an arch. And now we're then... using Maureen's clear tape today so it looks good. Right. You want to hold that there for you, Maureen, while you do that? That would be great. And you just take the tape, wrap it around really well. And also, if the tip dies back, because we're really tying it too tight for it to stay living on the other side, don't cut it off, because it will still remain a structural support for this limb. OK. That's really all there is to it. So what if you want to make another arch in your, in your pegging, since we have a few of these to work with, so that you'd have right. two sort of arches of flowers? Exactly, and that can give you different levels you're going to have tiers right, of that. roses. Sort of bowers of flowers. Right. right, now to do this, I think what we can do is tie this, you can tie them anywhere. You can tie them to themselves, you can tie them to their neighbor, you can tie it to the stake. Um, this time of year, I think I'm gonna tie it to his neighbor. And so let me take these two and again tie them together. So I think with these two starters, we're doing pretty well with our pegging. And of course, there's a lot of other material to work with. You wouldn't peg all of these. No. You would just choose the best ones that would make the best structure and then prune everything away. Exactly. And then we, you could actually just do consecutive arches. And it would be no wider than the space that we have here. Exactly. And it's controlled, and it blooms just how you want it. Thanks so much, Maureen. Up next. Keeping your garden in tip-top shape with sharp clippers when DIY Growing Roses continues. I'm Kathy 
Steve Fillion. And I'm Steve Piacenza. We love working with glue and decoupage and ultra-fine glitter. Oh, you can do our projects with the whole family. The show is called Creative Juice. Today at 5 on DIY Network. I love black and white, but I also really love painting. By simply adding paint to her photographs, Kristen Atria blended her love of photography and painting to create striking works of art. So I love both mediums. And I just thought, wow, wouldn't it be just great to somehow merge that both? And what kind of effect would you get? I would say definitely a photographer at heart. Then comes in the painting, where I come in, you know, on top of the black and white photograph and add, you know, oil paint, color paint. So it really gives it a mixed medium look. So a lot of times people don't know whether it's a painting or a photograph or what. So it's interesting, you know, people don't know they can do things until they try. You just gotta go and do it. Don't think about it, just try it. Hey, neighbor, getting the three burner grill, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going with the four burner with uh, infrared technology. Oh, is that the four seater? Yeah. Nice. Mine seats six. Oh, and he's got the beverage center. Guys, I go with the choice deck. My deck's gonna be 10 by 15. Maybe two decks. At Lowe's, you'll find everything you need to make your backyard the best one on the block. Check out the gazebo. You got a gazebo. Lowe's, let's build something together. Go to Lowe'sHomeInvestment.com and register to win $2,500 in Lowe's gift cards through April 30th. If you're remodeling any portion of your house, you can't afford to miss this information. It's the information retailers don't want you to see. Our whole entire house of cabinetry was going to come to a little over $60,000. Direct buy came back with $38,000, so the savings is almost too, too good to be true. One of the estimates that we had gotten was $10,000 to redo this small bathroom. It ended up costing us, with everything, including labor, under $3,000. Just on our kitchen alone, we saved almost $10,000. It adds up to about a thirty dollars to $40,000 savings overall. Call the number on your screen now to receive your free insider's guide to buying direct. Plus, you'll also receive a free visitor's pass for an exclusive tour of your local direct buy showroom. Call the number on your screen right now to get started buying the direct buy way. Stop paying retail and become part of direct buy, the private members only showroom and design center. Don't wait another minute. Pick up the phone and call now. Flight 27 has been canceled due to weather. Our next departure is 6 a.m. tomorrow. No, hey, get late. It's time to play Take On Orbits. Today's players have bad weather, must book a hotel before the other 200 passengers. Go. Now, rose gardening is really easy if you have the right tools. So I've laid out some items that I think you'll want to have in your tool shed to keep your roses looking great all the time. Now, you don't have to have all this stuff, but you should have some of it because the right tool to do the job makes it a lot easier on you and the plant. And I have a whole great array of clippers here for you to look at. The first thing I want you to understand is that a pair of clippers is a very personalized tool. It's a tool that you're gonna be using more than anything else in your whole toolbox. And so it's important that it fit your hand. Clippers are available in different sizes. No matter if your hands are small or large, you should be able to find ones that work best for you. This Fiskars is a very strong clipper. I've used it and I do like it. It's got a little more padded hand grips. And for a lot of people, padded hand grips can be a really big deal, or if you have arthritis. So again, this is a very personalized choice that you make. And you may end up buying a few until you find the one that works best. A good pair of clippers should last you 20 years. I mean, they're not something that you're just gonna get. It's not part of our throwaway society. They're a good investment. Buy one you like and keep it. Another thing you should know about your clippers is that this is one of the easiest ways to spread disease from one plant to another. Diseases like black spot and fire blight are very often transferred by pruning equipment. If you have a, a sick plant, it's better to disinfect your clippers after you cut it or make it a practice of disinfecting them after every major pruning episode that you have. And it's really very easy to do. You can use a 25% bleach solution, 75% water. Bleach is probably your most common disinfectant. And just spray the blades. 
I like to leave the bleach on just for a second so it can do its job. Then dry the blade thoroughly. And then you don't want to just leave it like that because you can have rust developed from doing that. So I like to just add a little bit of this Corona oil and just seal that blade with the oil real well and then seal this part as well. And that way the pruner will work beautifully next time you pick it up. Now if you're doing really big pruning jobs, you're gonna need a little bit heavier artillery. So I have two examples. Now this is a big heavy duty pruner, but this kind of pruner is really important if you're doing really big roses. And if you have a really big climber that's overgrown and hasn't been pruned in years, you could have some monster canes on there. So it may take a pruner of this magnitude to fix it. But it's a heavier pruner, so using this thing all day, especially if you're not very strong, can be a real difficult thing to do and you'll get tired. So my favorite pruner are these nice little light Coronas. They have good, nice small grips that are comfortable in my hands. And if you choose a pair of loppers, make sure that when it's completely closed, that there is no chance of hitting your knuckles on one another. Some of the poorly designed tools will have that problem, and it's very painful if you get it wrong. And finally, I, I like to have a pruning saw. It's very, very helpful on probably the largest material you'll ever see with a rose. And I like the folding ones because you can put them in your pocket. They're easy to carry around. And I like the ones that have the single blade that sticks out because you can slide it in between different canes and get it in tight spaces and work them out real easily. So this is also very important. And with your loppers, with your pruning, with your folding saw, always keep them well oiled. Don't leave them out in the garden in the rain. I've done this dozens of times and I've lost more tools than you can ever imagine. So keep them oiled, keep them inside, take good care of them, and you'll have great success, I guarantee it. And you'll never have enough tools in the tool shed, but at least these items will get you started growing roses in your garden. I'm Maureen Gilmer. Thanks for watching.